As you're taking your Bibles and turning back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago, let me once again remind you we are leaving the parking lot here at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Please do not be late. 3 o'clock, heading down for Marcus Hook for a wonderful service of Thanksgiving, testimony, music. You remember last year how many people had uh, the opportunity of playing musical instruments, great hymns of praise, uh, different choral groups singing together and testimonies being given, preaching from the Word of God. It's a wonderful time, and we encourage you to be here at 3 o'clock this afternoon. The service starts at 4 down in Marcus Hook. We'll be leaving the parking lot at 3 o'clock this afternoon. At what time? 3 o'clock. I had somebody call me this week and say, now we're leaving at 4 o'clock, right? No. Service starts at 4 o'clock in Marcus Hook, leaving the parking lot here at 3 o'clock. So we encourage you to be with us for that. It'll be a wonderful time of fellowship followed by a fantastic meal that all the ladies, not only from Marcus Hook, but from our church and several other churches, have prepared for that as well. So join us this afternoon. Now, of course, as you know, today is Thanksgiving Sunday. And although we are not in the season of Passover right now, truly, Passover is the season of Thanksgiving for Israel. God delivered them from the oppressing nation of Egypt to worship him in freedom. God delivered our forefathers here in America to worship him in freedom without the oppression of the state church. So in a real sense, the study of Passover on Thanksgiving Sunday is more than appropriate. And it's also a reminder to give thanks to the God who has given us our freedoms here in the United States. We take that for granted, but it may soon disappear in the flurry of all of the wicked activity of those who would seek to remove our freedoms all the way from the secularists, all the way to the Islamic terrorists. Your people enjoy the freedom while you have it. Our forefathers paid it for it with their blood. And now we find Passover. Last week, you recall, we added a few additional thoughts out of Exodus chapter 11. Yet one more plague God said he would bring. God determines the end from the beginning. God knows when it's going to be over. God knows when it's going to be over for the United States. God knows when it's going to be over for this dispensation of the church when we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air and evermore be with the Lord. And then the great tribulation here on earth. One more, one more. Perhaps it'll be today. We saw that there were painful things that had affected Israel and Egypt. And it was going to affect the families of Egypt. Things that affect us are painful, but when they affect our children, they're even harder. God gave the Jews favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Only God can give us favor in the sight of the pagans around us. We saw that that was the reason for the mixed multitude later on, but they were a corrupting influence. And God said about night, about midnight I will go out. And we looked at Psalm 110, you recall, and saw the fantastic prophetic return of Christ portrayed in that psalm. Seven verses long, but one of the most important messianic psalms in the entire Old Testament. From the womb of the morning, that's Shahar, from the total blackness, the utter darkness, Christ will appear in heaven after all the lights have gone out. And we saw that parallel in Revelation chapter 16, where the fifth angel poured out his beast upon the seat of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain. And we saw many other parallels with the various plagues. The water of the river Euphrates is dried up like the parting of the Red Sea at the Exodus. Spirit of devils working miracles like Moses doing battle with the Egyptian magicians who were empowered by demonic spirits. We find God declaring it is done, just like he declares here in our text, yet one more plague. We saw the parallel with the hail out of heaven, because it says there fell on men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the hail of the plague, and the plague thereof was exceeding great, like the hail in Egypt. We looked at Melchizedek, also mentioned there in that psalm, a theophany, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament prior to the Incarnation. We saw how important that man was. We saw the fulfillment in our Lord Jesus Christ. He testifieth, thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. We looked at the fact that Jesus is our high priest because he continues ever and has an unchangeable priesthood. Hebrews 7, verse 24. And then back in Exodus chapter 11, we saw 
Nobody spoke out, not even a dog, when the children of Israel got up and left, because the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And God has put a difference between us and the world around us, and that's why we have that motto from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, be ye separate, emblazoned on the back of the choir loft. God has made us into a different kind of people. God paid Israel with all the goods of their Egyptian neighbors, and God makes sure that you always get paid one way or another for the work that you do. That's the law of harvest. We look at many things about the law of the harvest. And then we began our study of Passover. Verse 2, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. We saw that the first thing Passover speaks of to the Jews is that it is a new beginning of faith. Not merely a new beginning, but a new beginning of faith. They have two new years among the Jews. They have Rosh Hashanah, which is the head of the year. That's the secular year. It begins on the first and second of Tishri in 2015 this year. It was just a couple of months ago, September 14th, the sundown on September 15th. We talked about the relationship of those two different New Year's as the difference between like your physical birthday, that's like Rosh Hashanah, and your spiritual birthday, that's like Pesach, Passover. You have two birthdays if you're a Christian, one where you came into this world and one where you were born into God's family. We talked about the doctrine of household salvation because it says, Speak ye unto every, uh, all the congregation of Israel, saying in the tenth day of this month, They shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And we saw that paralleled in the New Testament in Acts chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. We saw God commanded that the entire lamb had to be consumed, none left over for others to consume after Israel left Egypt. There is no leftover salvation. There is only one lamb, and you must partake of the lamb before the plague of death hits. So God said, burn all the rest of it. A picture of what our Lord Jesus Christ suffered as he bore the pains of hell for you and for me. We jumped over the next few verses down to verse 12. We saw that the plagues were God's judgment on the gods of Egypt. And that is proof of who you trust is shown by what you do. I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. We saw that up to this point, God had spared all of those, all the uh, Israelites during all those awful plagues that had come before. But God told the children of Israel, on this plague, I'm not going to spare you if you don't obey me. Listen carefully or die. You have to have the blood over the doorpost of your house. If you don't, your firstborn will die too. On this occasion, he would not spare the land of Goshen. It matters not whether you are Jew or Gentile. You must have the blood of the Lamb. There are no exceptions. There are no alternatives. There are no second options. There is not a different plan, a plan B. When I see the blood, I will pass over, said the Lord. God used the tenth plague to teach substitutionary redemption. They were redeemed by the blood of a lamb. Something had to give its life that the firstborn would live. And it was a lamb. Passover is a permanent perpetual feast because it speaks of the eternal, permanent, perpetual, that is, once and for all, sacrifice of Christ. And we talked about how the Roman Mass is a blasphemy because they continually repeat the sacrifice of Christ through their Mass over and over and over and over and over. Because they confuse Israel with the Church, as do some of the Reformed people. It does not pay to confuse Israel and the Church. That leads to heresy. God gave it to Israel as a feast by an ordinance forever, Exodus 12, 14. Now God gave seven feasts to Israel. And I want to look today at the Passover in the context of the seven feasts as seen in their New Testament parallels. 
very important because this is the time of Thanksgiving celebrated by Israel. We celebrate it here on the third week in November. They celebrate Thanksgiving in the spring for what God has done in delivering them. Did you notice it says the lamb was to be observed for three days to make sure that it was perfect and without defect. This is not a once over, yeah, it looks okay to me, good enough for government work, go ahead and take that one. It wasn't, well, let's get the worst lamb we can find because we've got to get rid of it anyway and it's probably going to die, so let's kill that one. It had to be the best. It had to be without blemish. It couldn't have any scabs. It couldn't have any broken bones. It couldn't have any patches of missing hair. It couldn't be a lamb that wandered around cross-sided and banged into trees. It had to be a perfect lamb. And they were to watch it for three full days. You remember, of course, that Jesus was carefully examined during three full years of ministry on earth. And at the end of that time, just like with the Jewish lamb at Passover, where it would be pronounced clean and perfect, Jesus was pronounced not guilty upon examination by Pontius Pilate. John 19.6 I find no fault in him. The lamb was perfect. John the Baptist had already declared him to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. And at the end of those three years, after careful examination even by his own enemies who tried to find fault with him, at the end, even the Gentile ruler declared, I find no fault in him. The Jewish Sanhedrin could find no fault in him. They had to bring false witnesses to testify against him because they were determined that he would be guilty. I find no fault in him. Immediately after Passover, and we read this here in our text, is the seven-day feast of unleavened bread. In the Bible, leaven is a picture of sin, and just like the Jews must cleanse their houses of leaven, so must we cleanse our lives of sin. And Paul explains that to the church, to a Gentile church, because they would not have understood all the Jewish background that came in with Christ as the Passover lamb. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and following, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven, or we would call it yeast, leaveneth the whole lump, now, those of you who know how to bake, and I hope that some of you ladies know how to bake. <laughs> we taught all of our kids how to bake. We taught them how to make bread. We taught them how to make bread from scratch. When, when we lived up in North Jersey, we would buy between 1,100 and 1,200 pounds of flour every year. We'd drive to Amish country in Lancaster. We would buy it and put it in great big, huge garbage cans with a big chunk of dry ice at the bottom. And the dry ice, as it turned into carbon dioxide, would force all the oxygen out so bugs couldn't hatch in it. And all year long, my wife and children made all of our bread. We ate homemade bread for years and years and years and years when we lived up in North Jersey. And you know that if you put a little teeny bit of yeast or leaven in that first lump, that eventually it will work its way through the entire lump. That's what Paul is explaining here. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye, leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. You read the text. I hope you were paying attention as we went through it. The Feast of Unleavened Bread was for seven days, and he emphasizes and emphasizes and emphasizes and emphasizes for five verses in a row at the end of that chapter that if anybody eats bread with leaven in it, they are to be cut off, they are to be killed during that feast. Because of a violation, a breaking of the picture of the typology, the picture of the sinlessness of Christ. God's very serious about the pictures and types that he gives us in Scripture. And when you violate them, it may result in death. That's why there were those at the Lord's table at Corinth, this very same book that we're reading. 
who were partaking of the Lord's table in a frivolous manner, and some were gluttonizing and some were getting drunk. And Paul says, that's the reason that some of you have gotten sick and some of you have died. It does not pay to tamper with the beautiful symbols that God has given to us because he's teaching theological truth. And when you mess with that, you teach false doctrine. And God will not tolerate it. And so Paul says, Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Let us therefore keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. You see, he's talking about leaven as a picture of sin, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He said, let me give you another illustration. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. That is people who are sexually immoral in many different ways, not merely adultery. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous. Oh, there's another sin. Hmm. Why covetousness? Because Paul says in Ephesians 3, 5 and Colossians 5, 5, uh, Colossians 3, 5 and Ephesians 5, 5, covetousness is idolatry. And the covetous man is an idolater. God's not very happy with idolaters or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then you must needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, don't have fellowship with. If any man that is called a brother, oh, another Christian, be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. You don't even have dinner with them. What have I to do to judge them also that are without? That is, those who are outside the body of Christ. Do not ye judge them that are within? You're supposed to. But them that are without God judgeth. So what are you supposed to do with the guy who is involved in those kinds of sins in the church? He tells you, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. You see, Passover and unleavened bread, those two feasts, two of the seven feasts of Israel are very closely connected because they deal with Jesus, who is the bread of life, he is without sin. They deal with Jesus, who is the Passover lamb, who shed his blood to pay for our sins. And so those two feasts are tied together and always have been in the history of Israel, because God gave them together and said, celebrate them together, because it's a reminder of what I've promised in the coming Messiah. Jesus, the God-man, was without sin, although he bore our sins. That's the reason he had to die. That's the reason the Passover lamb had to die. Because he was without sin, he could be the perfect sacrifice. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians, the second epistle that he wrote to this same group of people that we've just read out of 1 Corinthians here. Chapter 5, verse 19 through 21, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Reconciliation deals with peace with God. Folks, we're at war with God until Jesus makes the peace. To be reconciled is for us to come to God admitting that we are sinners. That's why I changed the words of that hymn where it says, My God is reconciled. One of the Wesley hymns. Beautiful hymn. But that particular phrase is incorrect. It's, To God I'm reconciled. He doesn't have to be brought back to us. We have to be brought back to him. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For we have made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, if you've paid attention to my previous messages, you know the difference between justification and imputation. Justification is when you are declared righteous. It's a judici judicial, that is the act of a judge, declaration that you're righteous. But you're not righteous by yourself. You start out as a wicked sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So how do you get to be righteous? And that's the doctrine of imputation. You are made righteous when the righteousness of Christ is transferred to your wicked account and your wicked sins are transferred to Christ's account. 
And God looks through the lens of his son, Jesus Christ, and he sees you. And then he says, I can declare that person righteous because he has the righteousness of my son put on his bank account. Look at Zemai. It's a, a bookkeeping term for transactions in financial matters. And God has done that for you and for me. We are made righteous, and because we are made righteous in Christ, God can declare us righteous. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Because he was without sin, he could be the perfect sacrifice. Hebrews 4 also says it, verse 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Yet without sin. You know, temptation is not sin. Most of us equate temptation with sin because of the way we always respond to temptation. So we figure, if it's temptation, it's got to be sin because I always respond to it the wrong way. Temptation is an attack. The question is, do you yield to the attack? I've given you the illustration before of if you had this gigantic thousand foot solid stone fortress with walls that were 150 feet solid stone thick. And it's completely covered over all the way on top on all four sides, solid stone. And then there is one door into it, and that is a steel door that slides out and you can come in and then it slides back in and the door is 100 feet thick, solid steel. And along comes a band of Apache Indians, whooping and hollering and waving their war hawks and all painted over with their paint and all their head dress, their feathers sticking out every which way. And they, they come and they attack the fortress. They shoot their arrows. And they bang on the stone with their stone hatchets. Is there a genuine attack underway? Yes, that's an attack. Are they going to get in? No. Jesus Christ is not only man, but Jesus Christ is God. He's the God-man. One person with two indissolvably welded natures, divine and perfect human nature, welded together as one person. That's what's called the hypostatic union theologically. He can be attacked. He was. Matthew chapter 4. But he beat the devil. Jesus was tempted by Satan. And yet he turned aside every attack with, it is written. And that is what you have also. So when the devil attacks you, you can say, it is written. And that's why you need to know the scripture. That's why you need to memorize it. That's why you need to meditate upon it. Because you will be attacked. Do you know how to answer? He was in all points tempted like as we are. Doesn't matter what your area of weakness is, because that's always where the devil's going to focus. Jesus was tempted in that area. What is your area of weakness? It says here that Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And he's given you a promise in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And Jesus was tempted in every one of those points. No temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. We will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. That's the promise of God. I didn't have to make that up. That's not wishful thinking. That is a promise of God. It's as powerful as the word that God gave when he spoke and cast the heavens into existence, into being. And he made that promise to you. It's part of his word that stands forever. Forever, Lord, thy words are settled in heaven. Now the question is, do you believe it and do you take advantage of it when you are tempted? Hebrews 9, 28, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. 
That's two of the feasts. The Passover, Pesach. It begins in the first month of the Jewish year. The, the year of their faith as a nation. Coming into existence, into a new spiritual relationship with the God of heaven. And then there is the sin of, of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then we get the Feast of First Fruits. The Feast of First Fruits, Leviticus chapter 23, verses 9 and following. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye become into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then shall ye bring forth a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave a sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. In other words, on a Sunday. Interesting. First fruit falls during Passover. First fruit specifically foreshadows the resurrection of Christ. And Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 17 and following. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we of all men become most miserable. Now listen to verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of, of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ's, that is coming. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits on the day after the Sabbath, that is on Sunday. Why do we worship? On Sunday, the first day of the week. Because it was on the first day of the week that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and fulfilled the prophetic typology of first fruits. You see, as we're moving into this last plague and God is giving the feasts to Israel and God is setting the stage for what is to come. He is telling them about the Messiah that will deliver them not merely from Egypt, but will be their Messiah to deliver them from sin and from hell and from death and from eternity and darkness. Remember, they're in the plague of darkness right at this moment. God is giving light all over the land of Goshen. And the Egyptians are in darkness, so dark they can feel it, and not one of them moved in their house. It's a supernatural light. Egyptians had oil lamps too, just like the Israelis did. But they couldn't light any of those and make it be seen. They burned their nose on it, but they couldn't see the light. It says God gave light in all the houses of the Israelites. Dear people, this is powerful stuff because this is what is picked up in the New Testament to tell us that it points to Christ. Those three feasts give a foreshadowing of the gospel in Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 15. The gospel, as you know, has as its key elements who Jesus is and what Jesus did. Jesus is the final Passover of God's angel of death. All those who place their faith in him have eternal life instead of having eternal death in hell, which is not cessation of existence. It is conscious torment in the flames of darkness in hell forever. You do not cease to exist. If you do not trust Christ, that is where you will spend eternity. I've given quite a few messages on that in the past. will not cover here again. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. What is that? That's Passover when it takes place. Jesus is the Lamb of God being slain at Passover. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, which is not merely the... Oh, Jesus is going to die someday, book of Isaiah. It goes back to Passover. It goes back to the night that God delivered 
Israel out of Egypt. It goes back to the time that God instituted the Passover sacrifice lamb. Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. Remember Passover when you read that. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Remember first fruits when you read that. Romans 1. Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel, the good news of God. Same as 1 Corinthians 15, I declared unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Paul gives it to us again. The gospel of God, which he promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. You can find the gospel in the Old Testament. Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who Jesus is and what he did which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. What Jesus did, he died for our sins, was buried and rose again. That is the gospel, who Jesus is, both God and man. What Jesus did, he died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. It's got to be according to the Scriptures. You can't have a Christ who is not the Christ of Scriptures who can save you. Only the Christ of Scripture can save you. Oh, dear one, have you trusted him? Have you trusted him? Do you have the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of your heart? Only Christ can save you. You're not good enough to get in alone. Only Christ, the blood of the lamb, the doorpost of your heart. Do you know him? Do you love him? Have you partaken of him? Has he cleansed you from sin and love and bread? Do you serve a risen Christ, feast of first fruits? That's what the scripture tells us is Jesus. I want to talk today in the few remaining minutes that we have about the symbolism of the other elements of Passover meal that God gave in addition to the lamb and the way that the Jews celebrate Passover today. I want to talk about first the four cups of Passover and then I want to talk about the questions. Observant Jews today hold a memorial every year just like Christians do when we celebrate Resurrection Sunday which some people call Easter. For the Jews, Passover and their deliverance from Egyptian bondage is just as significant to them as Christians who have been delivered from the power of the devil by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And do you know that's what he did? He delivered you from the power of the devil and from the fear of death. Hebrews 2 says so. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, speaking of Christ, himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, that's Passover, he might destroy him. That's the angel of death passing through the land that had the power of death. That is the devil. I think I've told you in the past, we'll not go into the full study here, but that Pharaoh, a real man, is a picture or a type in scripture of Satan and Egypt is a picture of the world. who through death destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them, that's us, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You and I were slaves because we feared death. I have no fear of death anymore. No fear of death. I've often thought about it. I've thought about it with joy. I know that God has left me here for a purpose. I don't try to hasten it. I try to use the time that God has given me wisely every morning. I pray for that, for wisdom, to use every minute of the day for Christ. Not to do things that are stupid, things that are wicked, things that are foolish. Because the day belongs to Him and I commit every day to Christ before I even roll out of bed. Book of Proverbs tells us, Commit your works unto the Lord and your thoughts will be established. And so I commit to Him my works before I even start them. And I beg him to please establish my thoughts so that he will put it together because there is so much to do. Martin Luther once said, I have so much to do today that I'm going to have to spend five hours in prayer. In other words, Lord, you've got to show me because there is way too much. It won't all fit. But God can make it dovetail. 
so that your day accomplishes something that lasts for eternity. Who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Jesus Christ is not only God, he is man. He was Jewish. He was a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And through the tribe of Judah. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. That's us. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. High priest once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Leviticus chapter 17. Once a year, we go behind the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. And he would take with him blood. And he would sprinkle it upon the Ark of the Covenant seven times. To make atonement for himself and for the sins of the people. Jesus didn't have to make atonement for himself. But he did for his brethren. That's for us. He put it on the mercy seat. The covering over the top of the ark between the two cherubim. The word for mercy seat in the book of Hebrews is hilasterion. And it tells us that Jesus, Jesus is our mercy seat. The blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat on Calvary to make reconciliation, to give us peace with God. Oh, dear friend, are you at peace with God? Are you at peace with God? Jesus died to destroy him while the power of death and through all their lives those who were under his bondage had a fear of death. Do you have peace with God? That's what Hebrews is talking about. And then verse 18, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he was tempted. Temptation is not sin. It's an attack. He is able to succor, that is, come to the aid of them that are tempted. When you are tempted, do you cry out for Jesus to come to your aid? He has promised that he will. He has promised that he will. That it will not be too strong for you to bear. God will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. He has promised that he will. Dear people, that's Passover. That's Christ. The Orthodox and the Orthodox and conservative Jews and even some of the Reformed Jews spend days cleaning their houses to make sure that there is no leaven in their house. It's ritual. They don't understand the meaning and its relationship to sin. They spend days shopping. They spend days preparing the meal, just like Americans are going to do this week with Thanksgiving. Traditionally, Jewish families go throughout their entire house with a wooden spoon, a feather, and a lit wax candle looking for any crumbs containing leaven. Usually they leave a few cracker crumbs for the children to find. Because that's very exciting. They're teaching object lessons to their children. I wish we would do the same. And then when the crumbs are found, the kids are all excited and they gather them up. They sweep them into the spoon with the feather and then take them outside and burn them. Very fitting picture of sin and the destruction of fire it will come to those who have not come under the blood. No yeast products may be eaten during that period. Still going on today, folks. In most Jewish homes, there are special dishes and silverware that are used only at Passover. There are beautiful candles and other table settings. There will probably also be matzo ball soup, which is chicken soup with matzo balls and special spices. Gefelte fish. Slimy gefelte fish. <laughs> I've had gefelte fish. I would eat it again. Yes, I would eat it again. But it's not one of my favorite dishes. On a bed of lettuce. There are the other things, of course, that are mentioned here in our text. The Jews hold a special Passover meal called a Seder. 
that usually lasts for hours. The full holiday, including the Feast of Unleavened Bread, usually lasts for eight days with the Seder on the first and second nights. The Seder means order and usually refers to the worship service that is actually held at the dinner table with either the grandfather or the father presiding. It's not the kind of service that you would find at a charismatic church, where it's a make-it-up-as-you-go-along type of a service. Each family member who's able to read follows along in the Haggadah, a book that contains the Seder service. The Haggadah tells the story of the first Passover in the days of Moses. It contains specific songs like Dayenu. It is enough. It is enough. They still sing it today. I'm not going to sing it for you, but yes, I have sung it in Israel. It also includes the four cups of wine or grape juice. Some Jews use wine, some Jews use grapefruit, which are a vital part of the Seder. And one of the most important aspects of the Seder to have the four cups. I want to talk about that a little bit, even though we're slightly over time. Why are the four cups essential at Passover meal? The reason? Because they remind the Jews of the four great I wills that God promised to the Jewish people in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Number one, I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. That reminds them in cup number one. Cup number two, I will rescue you from their bondage. Number three, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Number four, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7. Four great promises, and the Jews always remember those four great promises by the four cups that they drink during the Passover Seder. The four cups acknowledge that God kept his promise that he delivered his people, the Jews, from slavery in Egypt. When all four of them are put together at Passover, they provide a step-by-step -step memorial of that great past event. But cup number four also provides a reminder and an anticipation of one event yet to come. When God takes Israel as his people, it says, and I will be your God quoted by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, to speak of when Christ returns and establishes millennial kingdom. And I will be your God. The first cup is what's called the cup of sanctification. The cup of sanctification. It's drunk early in the meal because sanctification means to set apart. By this cup, the Jews acknowledge, remember, and praise Yahweh that he selected, chose, and set them apart for his own by giving them the Ten Commandments and the law. He hadn't given it to any other nations. He gave it to them. He chose them. He set them apart. That's the cup of sanctification. The father or the grandfather will offer a prayer of praise before that cup is drunk. The Hebrew word for sanctification is kedush from kodesh, which is the word for holy. This cup is called by the Jews the Kedush cup and is used to sanctify and set apart not merely Passover, but that cup is used to set apart every Sabbath as well as the Passover. It reminds the Jewish people that God has chosen them and set them apart from all of the Gentile nations. You know, God has chosen us and set us apart. Let me remind you, 2 Corinthians 6.17. The Jews remember that every week. The second cup is called the cup of praise. That cup is drunk after the reading of the story of the Exodus, which to the Jews is the ultimate account of liberation from slavery. The cup of praise. The father or the grandfather will then offer a prayer of praise to God for keeping his promise to deliver a remnant of the Jews in every generation of Jewish history. His prayer of praise will usually include praise to God for delivering the Jews from Egypt, from Babylon, from Medo-Persia, from Greece, from Assyria, from Rome, and often will include praise for delivering the Jews from Russian and Polish pogroms, the Spanish Inquisition, from Hitler and Mussolini during the, during the Holocaust, and from other persecutions depending on the national background of that particular Jewish family the cup of praise. 
The third cup is known as the cup of redemption. And that, of course, fits where the third thing out of Exodus 6 is, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And so this cup is the cup of redemption. It is drunk after the meal is ended and after the afikoman is found. And I'll tell you, well, I won't be able to do it this week, but Lord willing, next week I'll tell you about the afikoman. But first look at that third cup and its meaning. In the ancient biblical word, redemption is the term used to speak of slaves being purchased and then set free. God purchased Israel and their firstborn by providing a substitutionary redemption lamb so that the firstborn would not be killed. The lamb gave its life so that the family that was under the blood might live. At the first Passover, God not only freed the Jews from physical slavery to Pharaoh, but he also freed them from the gods of Egypt and the filthy practices of that pagan culture. Remember what God said about the plagues? Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. That third cup has particular significance for us as Christians because it's that third cup that Jesus took after supper in Luke 22, 19 through 20. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. This is the cup of redemption. Likewise, also the cup after supper. We know exactly which cup it was, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. That's why the Apostle Paul, a highly trained Jewish scholar, but also the Apostle to the Gentiles, wrote to the Gentile Christians so that they would understand the connection between Christ, the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread in that passage in 1 Corinthians 6 I read a moment ago. Your glorying is not good, know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but of the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I'll just move quickly through the fourth cup, and then we'll cover it a little more in detail next week, But so that you have all four cups. The fourth cup is called the cup of acceptance or the cup of anticipation. The cup of anticipation. The fourth cup symbolizes the relationship that God has promised in the future with his people Quote, when all Israel shall be saved. The fourth cup is the promise of the return of the Messiah to deliver Israel and to establish the Messianic kingdom. Romans 11:25 and following. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. Not altogether, for there are Jews who have come to Christ since the cross, but in a very large part, there is still blindness in Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles shall become in. And so, at the end of the fullness of the Gentiles, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there is coming a day when all Israel is going to be saved. We've talked about it out of the book of Hosea, chapter 6. In three days, the last three days, the Jews are going to cry out for the Messiah. They're going to repent for two days, and the third day they'll cry out for him, and he will come back to deliver them. Revelation 19. And so all Israel shall be saved. That is, it's written, verses 11, 26 of Romans. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away in godliness from Jacob. That's a reference back to Psalm 110, which we studied last week. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins, as concerning the gospel their enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, their beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The promises that God made to Abraham, God is going to keep. God is going to keep. For as you in time past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy... What are you doing to reach them? They also may obtain mercy. What are you doing to reach them? What are you doing to reach them? For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth of the riches, 
both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Who hath known the mind of the Lord, who hath been his counselor, or who hath given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. That fourth cup is the cup that Jesus used to symbolize the ratification of the new covenant and to illustrate what we call the communion service. Jesus had already drunk three cups with the disciples up to that point. But as you read the text closely, it's interesting to note that he does not appear to have drunk that cup when he gave it to his disciples. Instead, he said that he will drink it with them when the Messianic kingdom is established. We don't have time to get into it today, but that should raise some questions about the popular Christian concept of kingdom building here and now, not understanding the mystery aspect of the kingdom. Jesus is the one who will set up the kingdom, not us, and it will be a literal 1,000-year reign on the earth. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. You know, all four of those cups are still part of the Passover Seder. A Seder that's practiced by every observant Jewish home today, even though their eyes are blinded to the fact that as they drink those cups, they speak of Christ, God's Passover lamb. Remember what we read? I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Well, we must stop with that tonight. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the pictures, the beautiful word pictures that you give to us in your word. And we don't have to guess. The New Testament explains them to us. We who are Gentiles, who didn't grow up in Jewish homes, who don't understand all the things that go on during Passover, things that we just sort of pass over, when we read the book of Exodus, things that we just sort of ignore as we skip through the book of Leviticus. And yet they tell us of Christ, the one who is not only the Messiah of Israel, but, and how thankful we are as Gentiles, the Savior of the world. Take your word and use it in our hearts, Father, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is Come Ye Thankful People Come, Raise the Song of Harvest Home, 797. Let's stand to sing all the verses, 797.